Let's go to God in prayer as we come to His living word. Loving Lord, You are also the living God. And Your word is like no other word because it lives. And these are the words of life and of truth. And we pray that You would bring this life and truth to our spirits and our hearts and our minds as we come to your living word in the name above all names Jesus Amen if you could turn or swipe with me uh, to your Bibles because today I, it's going to be a little challenging we're going to go through the entire 17th chapter of John we're going to go through it verse by verse so it's good if you have it I, I, do have it up on the screen, I think. Yeah. Now, by the way of introduction, we have been going through the scriptures from Genesis all the way through now. Uh, we are aiming to get through to Revelation before the Lord returns. Uh, <laughs> if He does, it will be redundant. But uh, that's our intention because we've been going over a year already, I think. But now we are in the New Testament. And in our approach to the New Testament, we have identified 53 central theological chapters in the New Testament. The point that I have made, and it's good to just frame it, is that the New Testament is not written as a historical record. The New Testament is given to us for theological purposes. It is for us to understand who God is and why He is. So, it doesn't really matter if you move back and forth because in, in these central chapters, they each capture or they reveal to us the deep truth or a pillar of who God is. Okay, so. What is the place of the 17th chapter of John? You know, in, if I say the Lord's Prayer, we all think of the prayer in Matthew chapter 6, right? Because the disciples said, Lord, how should we pray? And he says, well, pray like this. And he gives them a prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. But if you think about it, we could actually call that the disciples' prayer. Because they asked Jesus, how should we pray? And Jesus said, this is how you can pray. If we were a little more accurate, then I would suggest to you that the 17th chapter of John is more appropriately the Lord's Prayer. Because this is what the Lord prayed. It is also the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. The whole chapter is just a prayer. But we could divide it into three sections. The first section is Jesus praying for himself. <coughs> verses 1 to 5. The second section from verses 6 to 19, Jesus prays for his present followers, the disciples who are there. In fact, he prays this way and it's obviously prayed for the listener. He's trying to communicate something to them through the prayer. And then in the last section from verses 20 to 26, Jesus prays for us, his future followers. So those three sections, the first section, Jesus prays for himself, then he prays for his disciples who are present with him, and then he actually prays for us. So that's how the prayer breaks down, and what can we learn from this? So it begins by saying, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come, glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now, many times earlier in Jesus' ministry, he would say, the time has not yet come. Okay? But now we have sort of the high point, the, the focus of his life and ministry. And this prayer in the presence of his disciples is a declaration that what is about to unfold in the next three days is right at the focal point of God's purposes. The time has come for the Son to be revealed. And this was the direction and the dynamic of his prayer. But I want you to just note that last phrase. Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Because this speaks of the pre-existent Christ. And this is theologically very important. Because John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And there's an inclination to think that the son is not as important as the father. And it's important for us to understand theological, theologically that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal. And that the Son wasn't created later. Jesus didn't come into existence via the virgin birth. He came in the flesh via the virgin birth. But Jesus was with the Father in the beginning. Right? We also see in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. Word was with God in the beginning. So Christ, like the Father and the Holy Spirit, have always been. And why am I emphasizing this? Just to point out that uh, as Alan, it's interesting that Alan brought up this point of wanting to go deeper. What does it mean to go deeper? Is it just meaning spending more time in prayer? doing more church work. I think one important part of going deeper is in our theological understanding and, and getting it right. Because there are uh, strands or, or, or churches who, who would kind of put out like, the Old Testament is the time of God the Father. And then the New Testament is when Jesus came. And then after Pentecost, it's the era of the Holy Spirit. And they divide God out that way. They spread Him across time. And that is not correct. That is not at the heart of Scripture. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were there in the beginning. Christ and the Holy Spirit were at work through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the judges, and the kings. And then He came in the flesh in the New Testament. And we still worship and relate to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can never afford to divide that up. Okay? So that is centrally important. So, of the three sections, as I said, Jesus prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples who were with him, and he prayed for us. 
But of the three sections, the first section where he prays for himself is the shortest. Only the first five verses. I don't want to make too much of it, but I think it helps us to think that when we pray, we should pray for ourselves less than we should pray for others and for the work of the kingdom. Because I don't know, I, I suspect that we are inclined to spend a lot more time praying for ourselves. I won't ask for a show of hands. But, um, you know, I, I would hazard to suggest that over the decades that I have uh, stood at the altar and had prayer requests, and uh, I still have on emails prayer requests every day, uh, right through the day, and I could safely say 90% of those prayer requests are for themselves. And I think, as a simple principle, I just want to put out, without belaboring the point, the scripture gives us a key, it says, in giving, you receive. And if you spend a lot of time just praying for yourself, I, I think the dynamic is not really that helpful. And you find your life open up, your joy being filled, when you spend time praying for others and praying for the work of the kingdom and being a little less preoccupied with ourselves and our problems. So I just leave that with you. Right? <clears throat> Here we see that uh, Jesus is praying, although for himself, he's not really praying for himself as much as he is praying about himself. He is, the intention of this first part of the prayer is for the disciples who are listening to him. Okay, he's identifying to them the glory that he had and that he was there in the beginning. And this glory is something he has always had but he has emptied himself of that glory to become a man and dwell amongst us. <coughs> Now, we see that Jesus also prayed, in this first section, I just have the sort of peg word, is glory. Jesus prays about glory. But, although he asked the Father to glorify himself, it is in order that the Father may be glorified. It's not for his own glory. And I believe he gives us an example to follow. That we should not be praying, Oh Lord, you know, give me a promotion, make me the, whatever, the most famous guy in this place, or, or, or whatever, glorify me! <laughs> that was Lucifer's heart. Glorify me. I want the glory. But... I believe what pleases God is when we pray, Lord, help me glorify you. And that was the direction of Jesus' prayer. He said, now the time has come. Glorify me so that I may glorify you with the glory we both had in the beginning. So the application to us is that we can think of living in a manner that brings glory to God. It is a good guideline when, when you think of your conduct, when you think of your endeavor. Should I start this project? Should I begin this business? Should I apply for this job? Should I, how should I respond to this person? In the back of your mind, you can ask yourself, how does this lead to people giving glory to God? Because one of the things that 
I think might be the main hindrance to people coming into church is what they would call hypocrisy, right? And I'm sure we've all heard it before, people saying, ah, I don't want to go to church, it's full of hypocrites. <laughs> and I think, quite honestly, all of us are probably guilty of that. I don't know about you lovely people, but I certainly would be guilty, be the first one to raise my hand. If, if I look in my life, uh, Sometimes I'm inclined to be discouraged at my inconsistency, my lack of honesty, probably. And it is a constant challenge. It, probably the biggest struggle to say, what right have you to come up and stand behind this pulpit? and open the Word of God. It is a daunting task. And I covered your prayers. But, somebody's got to do it. And we all fall short of the glory of God. Nevertheless, I think it's a healthy balance. That we never deceive ourselves into thinking, well, I suppose I'm reasonably good now. And maybe I am in some ways worthy of, of standing up here. Maybe I do know more uh, than, than the people out there. I would suspect that is the voice of the devil. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of humility. And there is a constant need. We, we talked about the washing of feet. We get tainted by the world. Pride it's likely to creep in. And we've got to constantly remind ourselves that we have fallen short of this glory. And we struggle together as the family, as the body. Then we need to pray for and encourage one another as we try to be His witnesses. We mustn't regress to where we say, I don't want to be a witness. Right? Because I'm so unworthy. So I can't do this and I can't do that. And we end up burying the talent in the ground. God knows we are flawed. That's why He came. He knows. But He will enable us. And the critical turning point is we do what we do by the strength of the Holy Spirit and the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ. Would you say amen to that? Amen. How can we glorify God? Here's a suggestion. We can glorify God through our generosity. Uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 to 13, it says... Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, some of you might be already flinching because we are so weary of the prosperity gospel. Now, let me point out there, it says, the harvest of your righteousness, not the harvest of your stock investment, or your bank account, or your businesses. It's the harvest of your righteousness. All right? Now, that is not to say, at the same time, that God wants us all to be poverty-stricken. But I think the guideline here is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And it's God's intention to bless. So neither shall we begrudge Him 
the gestures of this blessing. But it's what we do with it, right? If we only want to serve God because we hope to get the blessing, then you're no different from the people who make offerings before altars in the hope of prayers being answered and, and riches being bestowed on them. But the guiding principle for us is that we have been created to be a blessing or to be blessed so that we can be blessing. So, so what if you were the richest person in Thailand? It's what you do with that wealth which is important, right? Uh, so, whatever we have, wherever we are, what are we doing with it? And we can all be generous. You don't have to be rich in order to be generous. I learned that lesson when as a poor Bible college student whose allowance from the church was 1,000 baht a month. <laughs> and I was walking with my roommate and then we were coming back from a church assignment and he bent down and he picked up this piece of paper on the ground and he looked at it and he says, Hey, look, this is a Singapore sweep ticket. And look, it, it, it is not a pass ticket. It, the draw is still to come. What do you think? You think God gave this to us? You know the prize is a million dollars? This was like in 1982 or something like that. A million dollars. So he started thinking, like, maybe God put this in front of us. Hey, what do you think? Should we pray? If we, if this, uh, we win this sweep, uh, we'll split it 50-50 because, yeah, I picked it up, but, you know, I showed it to you. So then we started like a pretty decent, holy Bible college student conversation. And like, what would we do with a million dollars? You know, think of all the things we could do for the kingdom. And so we went on this, oh, we would, we would help the church building fund, we would uh, set up this kind of thing, we would buy instruments for the band, and then we were off into outer space with all the things we could do with a million dollars, right? And by the time I got back to my room and I sat down, and I was praying and I said, you know, Lord, actually that's quite a good idea. <laughs> You've been listening to our conversation. You see, our hearts are pure. We, we, we haven't thought of, you know, uh, buying stuff for ourselves or all the wonderful things we can do for the kingdom. So what do you think? What do you think? I think it's quite a good idea. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, Leslie, what you don't do with your $40 right now, you won't do when you have a million. I never forgot that rebuke. <laughs> sure, it popped the balloon. <laughs> oh, well, there goes a million bucks. But it was a valuable lesson that was worth more than a million, I think. Right? What you won't do with your thousand baht a month, you're not going to do when you have a million. So, everyone can be generous. I have been the blessed recipient of hospitality from families and folk who have precious little. I remember as a young uh, boy, about eight or nine, I would jump in the car with my uncle and we would drive up the east coast of Malaysia. And back in those days, we drove and there's no more road <laughs> on a dirt track. And in fact, on one of the days, he looked around and he says, Oh dear, I think we better go back because I think we're in Thailand now. <laughs> <laughs> because suddenly all the shop signs were in Thai. So we crossed the border somewhere from Malaysia into Thailand. So we kind of reversed and got out of there. But it was that rural. They didn't even have a, any fencing or checkpoint. It was just, you drove and oh, we're in Thailand. So, while we were on that rural part of the northeastern coast of Malaysia, we would just camp every night. Uh, his car, we had a canvas sheet, 
then. Plastic hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> That's how old I am. So they had a canvas sheet, and we had a canvas sheet. We'll put it in the door, close the door, tie it down. We find a rock on either side, and that would be our lead to, and we we'll light a little fire on either side. And then in uh, in the evenings, and quite a lot of evenings, the the fish, fisher folk the, will, will come round. When they'd be coming round, like who who are these? Strangers here. Why is this man and this boy just, you know, sleeping under their car almost? Uh, and then they will come and chat with us, and then they would invite us to their home. And I remember going into quite a few of these simple huts. And as we walked through, they would, as hospitality, show us that this is our home. You know, it's simple. And, and I, one of the things that was so clear to me was that in their cupboards, there was hardly anything. There was hardly anything. But the man of the house would say, just sit down, we'll have some tea, and my wife will make something. And I've never forgotten that simple hospitality, a generosity of heart. Because from what I'd seen in the cupboard, they take taken out just about all they had. And they picked up this meal for strangers who they had no reason to welcome. Right? I mean, these crazy guys want to sleep out there and feed mosquitoes and lie under the car. That's their business. They don't look too impoverished. But they would invite us home and they would cook a meal and they would share what they had with us. Such a treasured memory. Several of them. This kind of warmth and sincere hospitality. Not from an abundance of possession, but an abundance We can all be generous. When new people come in, will they feel the warmth of our welcome? Will they receive of the generosity of our heart? And if we share in this way, I believe the Lord will be glorified. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 says, now he who supplies, we've read this, right? He will provide for you. The intention that you have is to be generous and to share in your life. And if people see this, they will glorify God. The second section, verses 6 to 19, Jesus prays for his current followers, the disciples who are there with him. In John chapter 14, we, we, uh, 13, we, we looked at the Last Supper, where he washes the feet of the disciples. And in John 14, he gives them assurance. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. Believe in God, believe also in me. This is after supper, he takes them out and he prays this prayer. Just before he goes off on his own in Gethsemane. This is the context of this prayer. So now he prays for his current followers. Verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. This is Jesus' affirmation of the disciples. He was affirming the fact that they believe in Him. And they have received salvation. 
they have understood why he has come. Okay? So, Jesus continues, he says, I pray for them, for I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, that is Jesus, so that they may be one as we are one. He is praying for his disciples and he is giving them this authority. Go in my name. He gave them this name when he sent them out, the 70 or the 72, right? And he says, go in my name and the demons will obey you and people will be healed. It is the name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. This is the greatest name, the authority of the name of Jesus. It's not power that we have, it's the authority that is bestowed upon us. If someone came in and said, okay, I need to see everybody's ID, everybody's wallet out and put it in this bag because I got to check your positions and your ID. And who are you? But if the authorities came in, they have to identify themselves, right? So they have a badge, they have, they have some kind of identification. And they are not anyone in themselves, they represent an authority. They may represent the police department or the government or something. So we don't have power in ourselves. But Jesus has given us authority and the authority is in the name of Jesus. Because even the demons recognize the authority of Jesus. So as he prays for them, uh, he wants that God fills him fills them uh, with his joy okay and we can see here he says i am coming to you now but i say these things while i am still in the world so so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them i have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than i am of the world my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of them. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. But I want you to look at this phrase so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. how many of us feel we have the full measure of god's joy the honest truth is if, if i look around and, and not just here not, not this morning <laughs> but in different Christian churches or communities that I visited, I don't get this sense that everyone is, forget about full measure, <laughs> I'm not even sure about half measure. But I would like to challenge all of us. First of all, to receive of this prayer. Remember, God's word lives. And this was Jesus' prayer. And he says, if you pray in accordance with my will, your prayers will be heard. It is his will that we have the full measure of his joy. Yes. 
If you forget about the rest of the message today, I pray that you would leave this place with this desire in your heart and this prayer upon your lips. Lord, as you have prayed, let me receive the full measure of your joy. I can simplify it and I'm convinced of this. That if every one of us received the full measure of his joy, it would be the start of revival in them. Think about it. If each one of us receives the full measure of God's joy, it would be the start of revival in part. It would be the start of revival anyway. If the church and every individual in that church received the full measure of God's joy. Because His joy cannot be contained, you see. When we are in the glory of God, what happened to Moses? From afar they looked at Him. He didn't have to say anything. From afar they looked, he has been with God because he was glowing. And we have the full measure of this joy. We would be glowing too. You think? I don't know. I think about that. I am excited. I'm inclined to pray maybe 10% at a time, Lord. Maybe if I've got the full download, <laughs> I might burst. Because I think we cannot fathom what the full measure of God's joy might be. But I challenge all of us to seek God for this because this was Jesus' prayer. This is His desire that we have the full measure of His joy. And we seek to live with a sense of this joy. Let me caution, it doesn't mean that we now walk around with a stupid smile on our face. Because right? I remember I actually had a schoolmate kind of like that. And the non-Christians were sitting around and he would come along and he'd be like, hey, Hi, how are you today? Isn't God good? And they're all going, oh, here's Mr. Joyful again. I shudder to think. We don't want that kind of witness. You know, we don't want to be that kind of like loony fringe Christian, do we? The world is cursed. The world is cursed. God pronounced this curse. Henceforth, the soil will not yield its fruit to you. You will live by the sweat of your brow. And thorn and thistle will come forth. This earthly life, this earthly body, toils under a curse. That is the reality. From the moment we are born, we will. And at the last gasp, we cry again. Life is a struggle. And I think we as his witnesses who still remain in the world, we are aware of this struggle. We weep with those who weep. We strive with those who struggle. But at the same time, undergirding all of this, if our motivation would be the joy Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let not our strength be in our labor. Let not our strength be of our own feeble effort. Pray this prayer. Lord, as you pray, then, let me receive the full measure of your joy. I just feel, can we just pause for a moment? 
would you not look around, close your eyes and just raise your hands and I want to pray this prayer. Can we do that? Just to honor the truth of the word of God. Reach out and receive. Claim this from God because this is His will. Cast your cares on Him. He has said, let me take your burden. Take my yoke, for it is light. Lord, as we reach out to you now, in the spirit of truth, the truth of your word that you have declared here amongst us, that your heart's desire is that we receive the full measure of your joy. Yes, we sit here and we have problems and we have anxieties and we have worries and we have fears. And the circumstances don't necessarily change immediately. But beyond our human understanding, we ask that you bestow upon us in a divine and special way, in the name of Jesus, who prayed this prayer, that the full measure of your joy be sent upon us. And I pray that if really we are able to receive this, that it might be the beginning of revival. Transform us, O Lord. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Keep holding on to that. Don't let it go. Huh? You go home today and you get a message or you go to some friend's Facebook. And I've got people I'm praying for who are at the hospital. A couple who were just here a few weeks ago, I just got a text message that cancer has returned. This life is a struggle. But I will hold fast to the truth of God's word. And I pray for her that the full measure of his joy, even in the midst of this very debilitating and difficult news, that in the core of her heart, the joy of the Lord might be first. I want to encourage you because that will be the point of witness. This, this world is a difficult place. But if we can really live with joy, it will be recognized. I recently had a conversation with someone and he was talking about his promotion and he was saying how reluctant he was because he didn't feel capable enough to receive that promotion and he didn't understand why his superiors would want to promote him. How's that for humility? <laughs> but anyway, he then told me that he went to his superiors and he asked them, why have you promoted me to this position? I'm not sure I'm capable enough. And one superior said to him, it's because you are a good man. And his response to that was, what's that for an answer? And he went to the second superior who had responsibility for the promotion and this person was Muslim. And he asked him, why have you promoted me? And this Muslim friend or superior's reply was, because you are a man of faith. So when he shared this with me, my heart leapt. And I encouraged him and I said, what? This is wonderful. It tells me that you're living in such a way that the world has recognized it. That your superiors have the discernment to know that it is more important to have a good man. Capable people, they're all around. Capable people are not that difficult to find good people. They've even made a movie about it, A Few Good Men. 
but I totally irrelevant. But <laughs> And so here's this affirmation. You are a good man. You are a man of faith. I would be deeply blessed by that affirmation. Because I think that is far more important than, oh, you're really capable. Oh, you have the qualifications. Oh, don't worry, we're sure you can do it. I, I, my encouragement to him was give thanks that God has placed such superiors over you, that they recognize a good man and a man of faith. The last section, Jesus prays for us, his future followers. He says, my prayer is not for them, those who are with him alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Jesus prays for all of us. And here is a really difficult challenge. What is his prayer for the church that is to come? That they may be one. That they may be living in unity. I, I don't want to come across as being negative. <laughs> but by the same observation that I don't see a full measure of joy in a lot of Christian lives, I certainly do not and have not seen a full measure of unity in churches. I am going to stick my neck up here a bit and say I suspect that if we had a, all the churches and communities laid out before us, I'm not sure that a third, and that's me being an optimist, I'm not sure a third really have this unity. You reckon? No, oh, it's a third too much. <laughs> But this is not a, a, a statement of judgment or criticism. Please don't misunderstand my heart. I think we need to stand under the same light of examination. And I will go as far to say that at this point, the leaders that I have been blessed to work with, actually in all my years in ministry, I haven't been able to work with such a wonderful group of men and women. I'm truly, truly blessed to be a part of this fellowship. I'm so grateful that we have an opportunity to, to serve. Uh, I don't know, this sounds like almost too much, but this would be my dream church. You are my dream church. I've loved all the congregations I've served. But I think here there, there, there is a sense of unity. We shouldn't overly pat ourselves on the shoulder and be a bit <coughs> negligent. But I think there's a sense of common purpose. And, and I feel honored, and I've said it to them, to serve amongst a group of leaders where I really don't feel anyone has a personal agenda. But nobody is trying to say, well, I'm slightly better than that guy and I should have more place of honor or something. But there don't seem to be any egos involved. And I think God has brought us together for a reason. And I give thanks to Him 
for the opportunity. And we should constantly monitor one another so we don't regress in any sort of way, so we don't get too complacent or proud of ourselves. But this is what God would honor. If our focus is on Him and on His work and His kingdom, we are not trying to build our kingdom here. This is Christ's church, is it not? Let this be the prayer of all our hearts, that as we move forward, however the Lord leads us, that we each bring our offering to Him, that we bring generosity in our attitude, a generosity of our time, of our talent, generosity of our love and our care for one another. And I pray that the spirit of unity might bind us together, because this is a strong witness to the world. The world is a divided place. Don't believe me? Tune in to BBC, or CNN. <laughs> Get your ambassadors out of my country. Don't come and kill people in my country. And, oh, kick out my ambassadors, I'll kick out 23 of yours. We are supposed to have progress. Society is supposed to have evolved. But there are more wars on the face of the earth right now than there have ever been in human history. The world is divided divided territorially, divided philosophically, divided in opinion. I, I just make a quick point about being politically correct. So in certain places you can't say anything about anything because you're going to offend somebody. How come we all suddenly became so sensitive? I thought if we were evolving, we'd become more kind and generous and we improve. But instead, we've all become hypersensitive. Shouldn't we be more tolerant? Uh, you have an opinion? You express it. I don't have to agree with it. We, we can agree to disagree and accept one another's opinion. If somebody says something that you feel is ignorant, pray for them. Why do we want to get upset? Aren't there enough things in life to get upset about? So we are the counter, we are the antidote to the ways of the world. And if people come in, and they see that we have a spirit of unity. We are from different nations. There are like, last count, like 15 to 20 different countries here. We have different cultures and different backgrounds. But it's pleasing because this is a foretaste of heaven. That we live together. That we accept one another. So, I commend this prayer to you. I suggest in the spirit of Alan, as you go deeper, I suggest that you spend this afternoon or this evening or the next week just reading John 17 over again. It's taken me quite a few reads to even really get a feel because it's, it's very sort of theological in, in presentation. You know, I am in you and you are in me and we are in them. And, okay, <laughs> let me read that again. Uh, read a few times, but I think the beauty, the truth of God's Word will bear fruit in your heart so that your joy may be full. So in summary, take these three words with you. Glory, joy, unity. May the full measure of His joy be upon you. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of this prayer in the 17th chapter of John. 
an eternal prayer, an expression of your heart, that you counted equality with God not something to be grasped, but you emptied yourself to be a servant, to be obedient even to death upon the cross. We approach Holy Week. We think of your obedience, your suffering, your death, and your resurrection. Hallelujah. For it is your resurrection that validifies all things. It is your resurrection that makes the full measure of joy ours. So Lord, bless this prayer to us. Inscribe it upon our hearts. May we live for your glory. May we go forth in joy. And may we encourage one another in unity. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Would you stand for the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, the joy, the unity of the Holy Spirit be upon you as you go forth to be His witnesses. Amen.